This is the Investor Connect podcast program. I'm Hall T. Martin. I'm the host of the show in which we interview angel investors, venture capital, family offices, private equity, and many other investors for early stage and growth companies. I hope you enjoy this episode. Investor Connect is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors and startups for fundraising. Please consider donating $100 to the program to help others in their investor and entrepreneur journey. You can find the donate button on the InvestorConnect.org website. Well, hello, this is Hall Martin with Investor Connect. Today, I'm here with David Nero, CEO at Sonavex. Sonavex is a venture-backed clinical stage medtech company spun out from Johns Hopkins with two FDA clearances. The company's technology uses deep learning to improve AVF maturation times for patients with end-stage renal disease. David, thank you for joining us. All great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. So where does this podcast find you today? Uh, I am at the home office here in Baltimore, Maryland. Great. So tell us more about your background. What did you do before this? Sure. So uh, I started my career as a biomedical engineer. I uh, did my graduate work at Johns Hopkins, which is where I met a professor and surgeon who I co-created the technology for our business together with um, and ended up starting the company Sonovex together. Um, before we did start the company, I went up to Boston to do healthcare strategy consulting, um, primarily for med tech clients, but also therapeutics, diagnostics, and some digital health work as well. Um, and then after a stint there, realized that the technology we had worked on at Hopkins that had advanced far beyond my technical aptitude in the lab with my colleagues, um, got to a really exciting point, and there was a really compelling commercial opportunity as well to really bring this to patients. So I came back to Baltimore, spun out the intellectual property, and we formed Sonovex around that technology. Great. Well, let's talk about starting a business in the area of med tech itself. Uh, what do you find is the major opportunity there? I think the biggest opportunity is that there's a lot of purpose uh, behind what you're doing. So with any early stage company and in a lot of work, you know, there's a lot of a lot of challenging times and you know, you're busy, you're stressed, there's a lot of things going on and, and it can feel overwhelming. But when you know that there's purpose at the end to really get this to patients and, and really help not only patients, but also other stakeholders in a meaningful way at scale, uh, it's a really helpful motivator uh, and can get people who are involved in starting the company and then also new employees who are joining uh, the mission to get really excited about that and, and to really bond together. So I think that's a unique attribute of our space that has made things um uh, more impactful um, and has brought our team closer together. And so what do you find is the main challenge in starting a business in this space? You know, I think with med tech, and I'd say the same is probably true with therapeutics, you know, you're generally looking at a pretty long path from when an idea is originally uh, ideated to, to the point at which you're showing um, substantial revenue. And, you know, in, in the medical device space, you have your you know initial concepts, you have prototypes, you have to get that patented, you have to get the thing built, you have to get it manufactured, you have to get it tested, um, you have to show that in sometimes animals, in cadavers, in benchtop testing, in human testing, you have to go through regulatory hurdles, there are reimbursement hurdles. So there's a very long path of sort of um, validation and inflection points of value that you need to achieve and milestones in order to get to the point where you can really start growing the business in a traditional you know, way of you know, growing revenue. Um, so really making sure that you understand and that your stakeholders understand that, look, this isn't a quick you know, 18-month turnaround from creating an MVP to showing and you know, what, what the revenue looks like. And you really do have to plan for a longer road to get to the point where you really have shown all that value and then have, have been able to sort of build that foundation to then scale from there. But I think the exciting opportunity associated with that is you're able to create a lot of objective value along the way before you do get to the point where you're scaling up those revenues. So, um, you know, the, the industry sort of recognizes value for certain parts of that path. And, and as long as you're aware of what that journey looks like, um, it's, it's a really fun path to take. So what is the potential reward? For example, how much are companies selling for here in today's market? Yeah, so that's one attractive place about the dialysis market in the medical device arena um, and some of the things that our existing investors have been you know, particularly excited about. So there have been three deals in this dialysis access space that we play in that have happened over the last few years. Um, and they've ranged in exit values from $225 million up to $1.1 billion. And those, the stage of those companies have, have ranged from uh, clinical stage companies that have no revenue 
uh, to ones that have just gotten across the uh, FDA 510K um, milestone, and then one that has taken the company to early commercial traction. So, you know, these are pretty exciting exit values for fairly early stage assets. Uh, so there's really a lot of um, a lot of interest in this market, given the size of the population, you know, the growth of the market and the amount of money that the federal government spends caring for these patients and how much can really be saved and how much more efficiencies can be created by delivering better care to better price. Great. So what are the differences between you and your competitors? So uh, our primary value proposition is to help get information that clinicians know they need without relying on the patient to have to travel long distances routinely to be able to enable experts to be able to collect this information. So what I mean by that is um, in this specific area, it's really important to understand whether the what's called AV fistula, which is a way to deliver dialysis for patients with end-stage renal disease, whether that fistula is functional to be used for dialysis. Uh, there's a proven method to assess whether or not it's ready to be used, whether it needs an intervention or whether it needs to be replaced. Uh, but right now, in order to get that information, patients need to travel to a specialist. There are not many of these specialists. They're often very far away. And therefore, the um, routine with which those patients are getting assessed is, is very infrequent. And these patients, they live pretty tough lives as well. So they're in the dialysis clinic three times a week for four hours a day. Many of them don't have reliable access to transportation. You know, spending your off day, so to speak, not getting dialysis, traveling for you know a couple hours to get um, your you know extra appointment and wasting a half or you know, all of your extra day on your day off is a huge pain. Um, so there are compliance issues. So what we do that competitors aren't able to do is we we meet the patient where they are. We enable and empower the people that work in these dialysis centers to collect proven, robust information to help deliver better care without requiring that patient to, to make that trip, which often doesn't even happen. Um, so we're bridging a, a challenging workflow gap with technology with our solution. Great. So what advice would you give to someone entering into the med tech space? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the there are a number of things to consider. I think with any you know, med tech company, you have to look at a number of things, right? First, you need to look at a clear unmet need. You, know, you need to be in a space where if you're able to deliver a solution in this space, it's exciting enough to change clinical practice. You need to be looking at a market that's large and ideally growing. Uh, just given the amount of funding that goes into these businesses, there needs to be an exciting enough opportunity on the back end to make it worth the investor's while. You need to really understand what the regulatory and reimbursement landscapes look like uh, to understand really what that budget and timeline is going to be to go from creating your solution to getting it to a point that it can actually be used in practice. Um, so I would you know, for sure start off by getting a bunch of advisors who have been through this this uh, journey before you to be able to you know give some insights there and and folks that can you know, open up their networks to be able to really get in touch with experts across product development manufacturing re regulatory reimbursement um, all these critical components that uh, clinical expertise all these critical components of the business that all need to be really done in a robust manner uh, in sync to be uh, successful whereas you know the, the people that might be coming into the company might have an expertise in one or two of those areas, but in order for the business to be successful, you really need to have that breadth of expertise across all of those different domains. Great. And so what online information source do you find most helpful in your work? So we've had, you know, we've used a ton of public information. The two resources that we've used most routinely um, are FDA guidance documents. So a lot of people um, don't realize, but the FDA publishes a ton of very clear and comprehensive documents that are very dry, but they're very clear enough for a lot of um, different technology types about what is expected, what type of testing needs to be done, and, and um, how to prepare for a submission. So we've benefited from reviewing those documents and ensuring that we have clear understanding of what's necessary um, to advance our technologies. And then one of the things that seemed daunting when we started the company uh, was quality management systems and you know the, the need, you know how much to document, when to document it, how much effort to put into that. And then um, a group called Greenlight Guru that provides an electronic quality management system started publishing a ton of really great information on a blog um, that I started reading early on. Um, it was totally free. And I'd recommend anybody starting a company who doesn't know a ton about quality management to just read their stuff. Um, it really helped boil the stuff down into simple language that um, anybody can understand and, and really help prepare your business accordingly. So um, I, I'd recommend looking at both of those different uh, resources. 
Great. And if you could start a business tomorrow in this space, what would that business be? So we've we've had the opportunity to really understand uh, the challenges associated with this end-stage renal disease or dialysis patient population. And you, you start to really feel for the patients who have to go through the current standard of care in order to really stay alive. And while you know our technology right now, we're able to improve a lot of the issues associated with dialysis and, and eliminate uh, catheter dependency, which is a big driver of morbidity, mortality, and cost. You know, if you if we could just eliminate that entire problem of needing dialysis in the first place, uh, that would just be such an instrumental thing that we could deliver to these patients. So, um, you know, with, with the appropriate resources, I think focusing on either an artificial kidney or some novel way to deliver dialysis that was less disruptive to a patient's life and would enable them to really live more of a normal lifestyle would be uh, an area that I'd like to pursue. Great. What's one thing your business did that you didn't expect? One thing that our business did that I didn't expect is I think we got um, early on the first regulatory clearance milestone we got to uh, very efficiently. Um, we were very fortunate that, like I mentioned before, we, we were able to find some experts early on that were able to give a lot of time to us and um, really mentor some of our plans and, and connect us with experts to make sure that we were using resources efficiently and uh, were able to get to some of those early milestones to show some traction. I think that was really uh, helpful to be able to show some results early on. Um, and I think one of the things that was really impactful is that we were able to also get some phenomenal early hires uh, onto the team. And, you know, when we first started the company, we always knew that, you know, you need to have a, a great team, but I don't think we probably understood how much of an impact having phenomenal early employees would be in to, to solving problems quickly and efficiently. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to identify and retain great talent, but if you do that right, it, it's just a, a phenomenal positive impact in your business. And it makes, you know, putting in long hours a lot more fun when you're working with smart, hardworking people that care a lot. Uh, so across our core team and our advisory team and our board, we were able to get some really incredible folks around the table. Um, and that has just made this process really enjoyable. And um, we've all been able to learn from each other and we've, we're really appreciative of that. Great. Well, in the last minutes that we have here, what else should we cover that we haven't? One, one thing um, unique to businesses in Maryland in the healthcare domain is that <clears throat> there's a program from the state that provides a, a 33% cashback incentive to investors to support uh, biotechnology and medical device companies in our region. Um, so folks that are interested um, should look at, look at the program online from the Maryland Department of Commerce. And if there are um, attractive companies you're looking into in the, in the state, provides a really uh, nice boost uh, to investors to allocate some capital into our region. That's great. So how best for listeners to get back in touch with you? Um, best is probably email or LinkedIn. So my email address is first initial last name, dnarrow at sonavex.com. Um, and then my LinkedIn, you can just search for David Narrow on LinkedIn and shoot me a message. Great. We'll include those in the show notes. I want to thank you for joining us today and hope you'll be back for a follow up soon. Investor Connect helps investors interested in startup funding. In this podcast series, experienced investors share their experience and advice. You can learn more at investorconnect.org. Paul T. Martin is the director of Investor Connect, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors for early stage funding. All opinions expressed by Hall and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Investor Connect. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions.